All right, hey guys, it's a beautiful day for music. It's a wonderful day for sound. Mark is here. This is part two of our percussion um, writing sort of course here. Hopefully this uh, uh, this is giving you some good information. Hopefully this is beneficial uh, for your uh, for your knowledge and education and things. Let's jump right into it. So in part one, we got right around um, measure 45 or so. And that's where we're gonna sort of jump back in here uh, today. <clears throat> Right in measure 45, we have this, um, what I call a, a vertical sort of uh, pattern. The, the, the actual rhythm is sort of unison based. Um, every instrument pretty much has the same two eighth note to um, hemiola triplet type of feeling here. Um, so anytime I see that the whole ensemble has something like this, I'm going to be very specific in how I try to um, help them punch that that particular rhythm um, and things. There's a few considerations that I have here. So I'm, I'm going to keep it extremely um, simple, especially within my bass drum voice. Notice that all of these are nice in unison here. Um, all of these are accented, even though they kind of drop back down here in this next measure. Same thing within my tenor voice, within my front ensemble voices. I have the marimba just at octaves, so they're playing with both hands. Uh, we call those sometimes double stops um, and things. My marimba too is coming off of the previous kind of ride cymbal woodblock thing that we have. So that person has one measure just to kind of um, put some of the mallets down to prepare for the triplets that come up after that. So that's why they don't have this particular unison rhythm. And then I make a, a, the same type of compromise here with my vibraphone part. They play these first two eighth notes and then they immediately move over to the concert bass. Notice it takes more time for that person to travel um, over to a different instrument as opposed to the time it takes for them to just drop two things, pick up two other things to get ready for um, these triplets here. Depending on the actual speed of the piece, sometimes I'll wait and have that person pick up on beats three and four here as opposed to the actual downbeat. So it really just depends on exactly how much time they have in this one measure, or maybe they need one and a half measures um, and stuff. For this person, they have to play these two notes, put down their mallets, and then walk over to the concert bass drum. Hopefully those mallets will be placed in a nice um, logistical sort of area here. I'm gonna start this just so we can kind of hear uh, going into this particular phrase, how it sounds, and then how we get out of that particular figure. Cool, so we see how we're sort of really punching that, and we'll hear it in the other um, in the other actual recording that I do a little bit of automation just to make it sound um, a little bit better. Let's move on into this next uh, this next part here. Basically, what I'm doing in these in these sort of three measures before I get to my arrival point. My arrival point is <clears throat> this measure 49 right here. This is right when we come back into um, the biggest chorus that we've had so far um, in things. So what I'm doing is treating these three measures here as kind of um, a buildup. And within the wind parts, we'll notice that they have a forte piano. They go up to these hemiola uh, triplets here, drop back down, and then do another kind of push. Once again, great job by uh, Mike Bearden um, with just creating these little pitfalls and pushes of energy, pulling it back, and then giving the, the full kind of steam ahead um, right on the, the final course there. So what I'm doing here is really um, trying to emulate some of that. Now, in, in, um, in practice or in actual performance, I would have to make a decision if I want these these actual mallets here to drop down. Um, but I went ahead and, and wrote a crescendo anyway, just so they can have it in there. They know where the musical direction of the rest of the ensemble is going. 
But a lot of times when I see something like this forte piano kind of business, knowing that these guys aren't mic'd and it's only two of them, that gives them a little bit of a time if they want to go ahead and play that fortissimo the whole time for that whole measure, even though everybody else kind of ducked down. In, in reality or in actuality, when you're when you're up at the top of the press box and you're just listening, if they drop that down too, you're not really gonna hear them. If they play that for real fortissimo, you'll actually be able to hear a little bit of that um, texture coming from the, the marimbas, the woods. You'll be able to hear a little bit of that texture before once again, the brass and woodwinds kind of take over around beats three and four here. So I wrote the actual crescendo in there, but in real life, I would probably have my 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 front ensemble if I had this particular configuration not drop down their dynamics there um, because of the overall sound um, and things. So it looks cute on the paper, um, but it's probably not something that I would actually do. I would absolutely have my battery go all the way down. So they have these double stops here coming out of the, the actual Hemiola triplets here. And then this, even, even what I would say maybe like the first two beats of this is gonna just be nice and small. And I'm really gonna wait to push out of these triplets into um, this next particular measure here. So pushing towards the last two, letting that sound blossom into this next um, kind of triplet roll figure here. Notice that my bass drums doing something absolutely simple. Same thing with my actual tenors here, just going straight down to drums. It's easy to get louder that way. Um, bass drums are following the melody here in the second measure. Notice uh, what's happening here. Da, 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 right? That sort of up down motion that they have going back and forth. So the basses are doing that same kind of thing just to reinforce what's happening. And then the snares and tenors have this sort of um, embellishment on top. They have that on top. And then when we drop back down, this is another one of those situations, kind of like how I was talking about in part one where I, I really try to help them out as much as possible with, um, within the composition, with uh, what's written on the page. So I drop that bass drum out. We don't have a choice but to play softer just because there's less people playing. There's a whole section that's not even really playing on that beat one. And then even my in my tenor voice, he's playing on sort of, once again, a smaller drum. Snare drums are playing nice and piano or pianissimo. Um, really just depends on the ensemble uh, size and their positioning on the field and things. And as we get bigger and bigger, the drums get bigger. We're um, pushing into the downbeat here. <clears throat> Within my front ensemble, they have these um, hits with them. Is it really going to be heard? Probably not. Um, but it's fun for them anyway. It's cool. A concert bass kicking in on those last three. The one, two, boom. Boom, two, three, four, boom, and it's nice and long. So we have one, two, short, boom, two, three, throw that towel off, move that hand, explosion, nice and long, boom, right on the actual chorus. Really helps to open up the composition, opening up those lower frequencies that'll really push through the ensemble. Now, this is the first time that I'm really sticking with uh, a consistent backbeat pattern. Notice that I've kind of shaded it and moved it around in different sections before now, but this is the first time that the battery has just kind of full on had a repeated, full on like rim shot type of backbeat pattern here. And, and all that is is just them um, camping out on this type of figure. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. Mm. So they're just kind of hanging out on that figure and they have rim shots. Notice the tenors are doing the exact same thing with them. Um, I could sort of take some chances and get a little bit more fancy here with some sweeps. Um, all a sweep is is when you start off playing a double, right? So two rights and I play a double um, with moving the 
moving the mallet over to another drum on the second note or something like that. So I can move around the drum. I was thinking about doing something like that, but then I'm like, nah, this is a time just for them to, to, to rock out, to have fun playing this nice, huge chorus. This is the payoff of the whole song. We've been waiting for this to get here. I just want it to be nice and solid for them to add a little bit of meat and potatoes to the snare drum voice. So that's why I just have them doubling exactly what they're doing here, as opposed to maybe having some sort of counterpoint sort of motion and things. Now, the motion does happen, at least for me, within, once again, these kind of arpeggiated figures that I have within the front ensemble. We'll get to that in a second. Notice that my bass drum part here is all unison, so there's not a whole lot of runs. I'm pretty much sticking with um, very similar patterns of what I've had before, and then I'm just trying to complement where some of these hits are coming in here within the melody for, for some of these notes and things. Let's check this out right um, going, going into it, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of the front ensemble parts. Okay, cool. So the way I actually came up with these particular parts here, once again, um, I'm still in um, sort of concert view, right? Which means that the transposing instruments up here are not transposing. Everything is being shown in a concert pitch, which um, makes it just kind of quick and easy to sort of just scroll through and see where some of the chords are happening and things. Now, I will say it gets a little bit weird if you're looking for... <clears throat> Um, setting up some of your textures and you're and you're very sensitive to maybe some exposed moment and you really need to know where the the sonority is of an instrument right um, it really changes the sound on a clarinet once you pass a certain point and if the transposition sort of moves it up or down and you think that maybe they're a little bit lower in their register so you have a certain kind of texture in your head um, because of the transposition that it's doing here to put it in concert pitch, um, more so something like the mellophone or something like that, um, or maybe like the altos. So just be very careful that sometimes it'll it'll maybe jump an octave or something, or it'll put it in a little bit of a weird place. Um, so make sure you kind of go back and check just to see, oh man, that's higher in the register than what I thought. The transposition moved it down an octave and made it into actual concert pitch. So just be super aware of that. But for the most part, just for analyst's sake, as far as figuring out where the chords are, it's a it's a good tool just to sort of use here. So checking this chord out here from, from the bottom, um, uh, I'll actually show you the chord via the actual way that I broke it up here. So I'm gonna start from the lowest note um, in this marimba. <clears throat> so I have a B flat. That's a D and that's a F. Now notice all I did here is just offset the, uh, the arpeggio, yeah? So I have a high B flat, low B flat, and then D, F, yeah? So this kind of a uh, thing. Oh, I didn't turn this on. <laughs> that's exciting. So I have a high B flat. Yeah, one and two and three and four and one, that sort of idea. Now, notice that that does not start until beat um, three and four. The reason is because they're coming off of this suspended symbol, and I don't want them to, to cheat that sort of spilling over of sound of the suspended symbol in order just to get to the sort of moving notes, right? So I'd rather they, they play fully that suspended cymbal, let it blossom, and then come in when they can actually um, do it in time and it sounds nice and good. So that first chord there is pretty much going to be a B flat and I'm gonna check it here. Yep, 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 uh-huh, 
Yes, yes, yes. Have a D, have some Fs in here. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, so that's a B flat chord. Just looking at what's happening here on this next part for the marimba, I noticed that this, this first note kind of goes up here, right, for me. So that's a C instead of a B flat and things. So most likely I changed it because the actual chords here change slightly. Um, we have a, a nice common tone here with this F. Notice that we have an E flat here. Wonderful. We have a C here. Beautiful. Um, walking up here, da 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 da, to this A. <clears throat> Very nice. Very beautiful colors here. And then the upbeats happening over here. Yeah. So. When I made that decision, I'm pretty sure I was probably taking it off of just seeing um, a natural progression of where that first note could go that could lead me into that next kind of chord change just to provide a little bit of variation. Because I see here that I go back to this actual um, B flat. At least that's what it looks like from there. It's kind of hard to see. Yes, I go back to that B flat. So I have something like this, B flat arpeggio. Yes, and then I go to C, back to B flat. So I have that kind of sound going on here. And notice that those sort of change as we move along with me keeping that same idea of octave arpeggio, octave arpeggio. And it's super easy to play something like that as a right hand lead, which is something that those players would be very comfortable with. Right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, octave, third, fifth, octave, third, fifth, or something like that. <clears throat> Very common pattern to do um, something like that. In the same way as if you were, once again, picking a guitar, how you'll have that pinky thumb, and then you'll kind of walk it up. Ba, oh, mm, mm, pinky thumb, mm, mm, pinky thumb, mm, mm, or something like that. Um, that could have been really in any order. That's just what I was feeling here. That could have just straight up uh, gone from the bottom. Right? It could have been any of those types of patterns. If the people were um, comfortable with four mallet stuff, they could have done any sort of different ar arpeggiated types of, of figures and things. And they can even play this type of figure also within sort of a four mallet kind of construct and things. So that's what I'm sort of looking at here. Now, my vibraphone person is coming off of that bass drum. Once again, giving that person time to come back here so they can just be a part of the chord structure. And then they switch over to a suspended cymbal here. Once again, nobody else can really make those sounds. And I am and I probably put it there just to kind of signify, okay, that's kind of the end of that little mini phrase. We're gonna get into a repeat of the phrase. And here we have just a, a slight kind of run um, going up um, into, the, into the repeat and things. Now, getting into this next part here. So coming out of the actual chorus, going into what I would call sort of the tag or the ending of the actual piece here. Let's take a, a little bit of a listen to it just so we can check out what we're dealing with and then let's talk about it a little bit here. Cool. So we have some transitional material that gets us into these two sort of hits. This one, two, three, four, mm, mm, one, ba, da, 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 this kind of thing. So I have these three measures, ba, ba, down, up, two, three, four, uh. So I have a, a measure of decrescendo just kind of hanging out, and then I'm coming back before I have these sort of three measures of hit. So I'm kind of almost breaking this down into three measures and three measures. The way I'm thinking about this here being that there's no, besides these eighth notes, there's no definite, um, there's there's no density of notes, right? There, there's no eighth notes or triplets or anything like that that's gonna lock me into playing anything specific here. So that's why I kind of chose to go into 
um, some triplets. It's just something to kind of break it up from the monotony of eighth notes to 16th note type of rhythms. And it just gives your ears a little bit of sort of candy. So I have this decrescendo once again, going from big drums here to smaller drums. Um, it's not always a rule, but once again, since I don't get to play um, <clears throat> kind of teacher teacher in this situation, um, I'm gonna do something that I absolutely will know that'll work and that uh, they'll definitely get softer. Um, so that's what's happening here in this particular measure, right? Um, getting softer, smaller drums. And then once again, in composition, I'm dropping out a whole section. So the tenors aren't playing here at their softest point there. Um, da, 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 da. And then 16th notes. I'm treating this almost like an A, A, B, A sort of format, right? A, ba, da, 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 da. A, ba, da, 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 da. B here. Back to A. It just really kind of holds that little phrase together, as opposed to me trying to through compose and just come up with a bunch of different rhythms here. I know that this type of figure is probably going to come back maybe towards the end. I'm going to maybe hint to it a little bit. The way I get to something like this is a lot of times I'll, I'll kind of write something. I definitely want me to set up something that'll come back. So something that'll sound kind of familiar. I kind of, at the beginning of the movie, kind of tell you like, hey, this character is gonna come back. They're gonna be gone for a little bit, but they're gonna come back. So that's why I kind of think about here with this A, A, B, A sort of format. Setting up these hits, nice and easy. Everybody has these um, quarter notes. Rest, ba, ah, ah, ah and then these two half notes here with the sustain notes in the upper brass, right? Um, one of the ways that I look at playing an, an actual roll type figure is I will use it as a sustained type of note. So the, the actual tenors here have um, a triplet roll. Once again, just giving them a nice little chance to show um, that particular skill set um, that they can actually do that type of thing. And it, and it makes it a little bit easy because they're coming out of um, a triplet type figure. There should be accents on here. Once again, this is the unfinished version of this particular arrangement and things. Going into this next measure with the half notes, notice because the, the high brass here hasn't really crescendoed yet, they're really sort of pushing towards the end of here. What I'm doing is I'm trying to build it back up. So they just got done with this and then they drop back out. And then these guys have this little 16th notes and these are gonna actually crescendo here. The basses are gonna crescendo. Pretty sure I would have written that in before the final, um, before the final send off. And then we have the same sort of quarter note motif here going on. Once again, putting that vibraphonus on the actual concert bass drum. Rest, short, 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 boom, with a nice explosion there some split up cymbal work within our two marimbas crash crash roll release there <clears throat> and then almost like a, a call and response thing with um the tenors how we had our little triplet um roll um here the snares now have it um within this next phrase right Yes, more triplet figures going into kind of a 16th note thing. I could get a, a little bit, um, I guess I could, I could have some, some poetic justice here. I could have a little bit of freedom because my, my main job for these two measures here um, is to, hmm, number one, bring down the context with the rest of these guys. So notice it's not just a stop and I have two full measures of something to contend with. All of these guys stop playing, so the high brass and all of the woodwinds, but then the low brass kind of taper off. Yeah, so that's why um, these guys here, this actual snare drums, most likely they're gonna be decreasing doing this thing. Uh, and then all of a sudden, they're gonna to start to kind of build into this next section. I'm not sure if I actually left this as a, a pure just um, 
loud thing that built into this next one or if I ended up crescendoing this particular measure. But either way, I'm gonna treat it kind of like a drum set feel, right? To the D, ticka 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 pop, boom. Yes, to the do, picka ticka ticka do, bam, right? Just pushing into that next phrase here. Once again, what's really gonna help me is having that concert bass drum. Now it's the second marimbas that's playing that concert bass drum. Um, our first marimbas here has some more uh, cymbal stuff. Um, Pretty sure in the end, this is probably actually like hand crash cymbals as opposed to them playing their suspended cymbal on their actual board. And then I have this sort of concept going on in the vibraphone voice. They're playing bells, but with brass mallets. And all I'm doing here is kind of making it sound um, uh, ethereal, right? I've heard of people refer to this sort of thing, especially when it's um, layered with multiple different rhythms and it sounds sort of sporadic. I've heard people refer to this type of thing as a, a, a meteor shower, um, a metallic shower. Uh, some people will say it's a ice, an ice storm. <laughs> I've heard people refer to it as, as a lot of those things. But all that's really happening is I have kind of various speeds of this arpeggio um, Technically, it's not really an arpeggio. I'm really just kind of playing um, the the first, so B flat and the fifth. So it's just one, five, one, five. It just happens to be uh, the octave up that time. And then I'm, I'm messing around with, um, I guess, the, the octave distinctions. So I'm, I'm kind of playing around with this sort of tonality here. I have this B flat, and then I have just... So it's, it, I, I want it to sound sort of unmetered that's happening on top of this other stuff. Now the effect is definitely heightened if I had multiple people playing different, um, different sort of subdivisions and different kind of partials and things. So um, it's definitely more so of a texture thing than a linear lining up of rhythms, right? You, I'm trying to create a texture almost like a shower of a storm, a waterfall of metallic uh, pieces there. So that's what's happening here um, within this. And it's just a bunch of ones and fives as far as the scale degrees go. At the end here, I'm messing around with a very common idea of having a three note phrase in a four bar or within a four beat construct. Right. Um, so something like if I'm counting the four here, one, two, three, four, I'm sort of splitting up that four into maybe like two, two sections of three. And then I'm kind of doing something else that has a little bit of a tag. So I'm, I'm counting it kind of like this. One, two, three, one, two, three, ba, 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 or whatever it happens to be. Right. So here, notice that we have um, this kind of figure to begin with. Ta, 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 tum, ta, ta, right? Pa, 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 on beat four. And then notice starting on beat four, I have the same kind of thing going over into the next bar, stopping on these 16th notes. So starting on beat, on beat four, ta, ti, ta, 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 ta. Four, da, bam, bam, ba, ba. So that same kind of three beat thing happened twice. It just looks a little weird or complicated because it goes over the bar line. Ta, 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 dum, ta, dum, 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 ta, da. And then a little bit of a kind of a tag thing happening um, on beats three and four of that next measure. Do, 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 ta, do, 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 cha, da, 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 ta, dum, da. Yeah? To me, um, as far as where I got that idea from, I'm sure it's from years and years of listening to drum corps, but one of the first places I really noticed it is um, within um, jazz music. Um, the way people would phrase certain sections of their solo, you would hear um, a, a sort of a, a, a three note thing like this, right? One, two, three, that sort of thing. 
but then you'll hear them do it kind of twice, right? One, two, three, four, the uh. Right? And they'll either kind of speed it up or even sometimes they'll just take the same thing. One, two, three, four, one, two. Right? And then they'll have sort of a, a little bit of something different to kind of tag it, tag it off. The whole point is, is that they're they're playing sort of an odd number grouping inside of still a four bar kind of phrase. It just makes it sound real um, hip and it kind of shades where that downbeat is. It just makes it sound more clever and a little bit more intriguing uh, when we do that. So that's exactly what's happening in measures 63 and 64. Now, to keep up with this hemiola idea that we've set up, boom, 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 ta doom, 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 ta da da ta do, I have another hemiola triplet here. Boom, pop, boom, pop. Yes, boom, pop, boom, pop, and then ta, ta da, ta da. Very classic <laughs> um, kind of stock uh, drum ending there. A lot of people are very familiar with that. Where does that come from? I don't know. Um, it for me, it's it's very reminiscent of listening to sort of um, a, a very specific period of, of of classic music. This dum da dum da dum. Like how how people would sort of end these these big um, kind of uh, orchestral pieces and things where everybody's just playing a unison um ba bum ba bum kind of at the end. That's what it kind of reminds me of. How did it make it into sort of percussion arranging? I don't know. It's very common, so it's nothing to sort of write home about and things. Um, let's listen to that ending here one more time, and then we'll kind of go through and backtrack in the other sort of program, just so we can hear the parts a little bit better here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what we're going to do here is take it all the way back to at least what we've talked about today, and then we're going to kind of wrap this thing up by listening to it all the way through um, while kind of looking at the music and things. And then if I have some other kind of general comments to kind of tie up this little bow of at least a very simple composition, something that anybody can really kind of jump or jump into, get their feet wet as far as writing for a percussion ensemble. Um, if I have any other kind of general comments, I'll sort of give those at the end. So this is kind of measure 44 all the way to um, the end here, and I'll zoom in a little bit so we can get kind of all of the percussion in here. At least I'll try, yeah. <laughs> Awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm gonna go back here. And I'm gonna do a little bit of some uh, strolling and things as I'm playing it from this other program. Once again, this is Logic, um, Logic Pro X here. And uh, basically just to describe to you what's happening, um, a lot of times, especially when I have a lot of sound design, a lot of voiceover stuff, and I'm creating a lot of textures, it gives me just a little bit more room to massage some things. I didn't do a whole lot of massaging here. I'll bring this automation track back up so you can see. Sometimes, um, even though you write a, a decrescendo or piano or something like that, or fortissimo, it doesn't give you as much of a range of a difference um, within my particular program, Finale. Um, and things. So you'll notice I did just some some very quick and simple automation moves. All I'm doing here is just turning some of the things down and then bringing some of the stuff back up on some of the pushes and things here um, and whatnot. So uh, very simple kind of arrangement. Sometimes 
uh, these things will just be going crazy. They'll be everywhere, especially if I need the mock-up to be very specific for the guard staff or for the drill person, and I have enough time to do something like that, I'll become very specific um, as to try to make it sound as real as possible. And, and one of the things that I really like to look to are for real film composers, people who write for uh, cinema, um, people who write for commercials, that type of thing. Um, a lot of times their mock-ups of their actual compositions have to sound as real as possible because when they go send it to their people to get it approved, they want to feel like it's in the movie. They want to feel the punches. They want to feel the bass. They want to feel the soaring highs of the of the violins and things like that. So um, this one isn't too specific. I didn't do a lot of sound replacement, but for uh, especially for a lot of my higher end clients, I will take a lot of time to make sure that happens because when they send it to the rest of their design team. And for some of these people, there's a lot of people on their design team. They really wanna make sure that they have from a compositional standpoint before their kids ever even see the music, they really wanna make sure that it's very specifically done and that we're tailoring and massaging all of the moments um, and things. So I'll do some of that massaging within this particular program. Here, just to let you know, I have the drum tracks a little hot in comparison to the actual uh, wind tracks, just so you'll know. Um, let's play it. So yeah, loads of fun then. Um, two sort of overarching ideas for me when I look at something like this. Thing number one, for, for a piece like this that's not percussion driven, sure, the percussion drives the groove that's kind of happening in the background and we're very useful for providing sort of the punch when it needs to happen. I need to be very sensitive to that as to not get in the way of especially some of the verses and some of the melodies that are happening, right? Thing number two, because it, it would be very easy for me to write the same thing kind of over and over again, I need to find different and clever ways to pass around the backbeat. Notice sometimes it happens as a rim knock, sometimes it'll happen as a wood block in the front ensemble, sometimes it'll happen with kind of a maraca and um, that's providing sort of the cymbal sound. So I'm very specific with moving elements that would just normally be on a regular drum set, moving them front to back within the front ensemble sounds, providing different textures and different sort of sound colors so it won't become too monotonous um, for the listeners and it won't become too monotonous for the actual performers. Keeping track of skill sets, right? Um, 
for two particular reasons. Um, reason number one, to provide the actual performer who's gonna be playing this music for a good two or three months with a little bit of meat, something that they can actually sort of aspire to and work to. And then thing number two, the, the actual competition um, element. What are you showing the judge that you can have as far as the actual percussion skill set? So having things like split up um, cymbals, having things like triplet rolls, various different types of things like paradiddles here, 16th note sequential type of runs going on, um, sort of playing threes or within a triplet format. <clears throat> having, um, even though they're very basic, sort of a, a basic four mallet part, it is there. And sometimes um, when people look at it, it is something that can kind of put you a little bit of a, ahead of another group um, that you can that you can show that you have that that sort of skill set in your arsenal. You have that sort of tool in your belt there and things. Um, multitasking with the maracas here in one hand and then playing um, with two mallets in the other hand in the vibraphone voice, right? Potentially playing the stuff here, 29, as permutations <clears throat> and things. Yeah, so just kind of keeping track of, of some of these skill sets. Once again, more uh, triplet rolls here and things. Um, backbeat section is nice and simple, more dynamic control, pushing up here, some punchy punchies. Yeah, so, uh, and then having a little bit of flavor at the end, that's a really cool sort of, of, of lick. I would wanna play it um, and and what and, and things like that. So hopefully this has been um, educational for you. Hopefully this provides value for you. If it does, make sure you definitely check out the links in the description. Go check out my Patreon. Um, it really helps me to sort of devote time to make these types of things. Um, I find it super important that I give this type of information, especially to people out there who are starting to get into percussion arranging. It's been definitely a wonderful um, sense of, of income for me as an educator, as a percussion specialist out here working in schools day in and day out. Um, to have that extra thing that I can that I can do and do very well to provide value to um, other band programs, um, it, it's really helped me out and it's really helped a lot of other people out. Um, in the next video, of course, we're going to start on a different arrangement, and uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you then. Once again, it's a beautiful day for music. It's a wonderful day for sound. I'll see you.